And let's just review where we are today and make sure we're all together on this. So, chapter one. Everyone knows, I hope they do by this stage, sources of authority and judicial, legislative, and administrative authority. And we moved into, and we talked about some policy objectives. Chapter two, we deal with what is income and its broad breadth. What is income? Once we're done with talking about what is income, we moved on and we spoke about some exclusions to income. What can be excluded from income, including gifts and requests. Also in chapter three, well in chapter two we saw imputed income wasn't taxable. Chapter three, we saw that um, gifts and requests are taxable, and we also saw these be the Waldorf decision that sometimes even if you call something something, but it isn't, as in the Walter case, that was the attorney who purportedly received the request, but it was really um, an in run to try to make compensatory income of requests, so it didn't qualify for recall. All right, then in chapter four, you guys learned about that fringe benefits under regulation 61-21 are generally subject to tax, but Code Section 132A provides a long list of items of things that are not fringe benefits which are not subject to tax. And then elaborates that certain people qualify beyond employees for fringe benefits, for example, uh, spouse, dependents, uh, retirees, can qualify. We learned about uh, reciprocal agreements, anti-discrimination rules, a whole plethora of additions. And then we moved on to chapter six. Chapter six deals with computing gains and losses, right? The key to chapter six is code section 1001. We looked at the difference between amount realized less adjusted basis and we computed gains and losses. Um, and then in chapter six, we learned that there's a whole series of code sections that help dictate what is your tax basis in an asset. So we saw that with respect to gifts, code section 1015 might apply. With respect to death, code section 1014. If you purchase an asset, cost basis, code section 1012. If you make improvements to the property, code section 1016 applies. And if 1016 applies, you have an adjusted basis under code section 1011. Sometimes a lessee might make improvements to the property, and if it's not in lieu of rent, it's not taxable, but there is no basis adjustment under code section 1019. So there is or there are numerous code sections that dictate what is the taxpayer's basis. Well, we saw, for example, even with respect to, say, gifts that um, and bequests, there is generally the general rule and then there are several exceptions. So if you give loss property to someone uh, for purposes of computing a loss, use the lesser of fair market value or adjusted basis. And then, even with debt, if a gift is made to someone and within one year the person dies and uh, decrees that property back, um, put section 1014E says that um, you, do, you do not get a step up in basis. So again, guys, we have our general rule, we have our exceptions. And we know with income, it must be realized, it must be recognized. With respect to losses, it must be realized, recognized, and allowed. We know that with respect to income, not all uh, realized gains are recognized, right? By way of example, Code Section 1041, right? Transfers between spouses, 1031 exchanges, uh, only limited to real estate now. We know with respect to losses, 
that not all losses are allowed. So losses on assets that aren't purchased for investment purposes or not in, or not in business, uh, those losses are disallowed uh, for Section 165. Um, we, in Chapter 6, we also turned our attention to computing the amount realized. The amount realized uh, consists of not only cash and the value of property received, but also debt, right? What's my authority for debt? Regulation 1001-2, coupled with the Crane decision and the uh, Tufts decision. So um, we looked at those opinions. Uh, and hopefully, Chapter 6, um, everyone here can tell me numerically what is the amount of the gain or loss. Right? Because you could anticipate it would be a fair game on my question to ask questions um, involving computations of gains and losses. Simple computations, nothing complicated. Again, for my purposes, no one here is going to have to compute tax liability. You're not going to have to complete any tax returns. Now, after we looked at, at chapter 6, we turned our attention to chapter 21 because we had to figure out what is the character of the income. What is the character of the income? And we looked at the consequences, right, of character. So the consequences are a preferential tax rate, right? That individuals get a preferential tax rate with respect to their receipt of income. Corporations do not, but um, with respect to capital losses, there's limitations spelled out in Code Section 1211. Uh, individuals can use up to 3,000 of their capital losses. Otherwise, they have to carry forward their capital losses. Corporations can carry back their capital losses three years, carry forward five years. In contrast to NOLs, net operating losses, notice one is from operations, capital losses are through investments, and beginning in the year 2018, Net operating losses can only be carried forward with my authority to put section 172. Did you say that one more time? Code section 172, you can carry forward net operating losses. Capital losses, you can still carry back three years, carry forward five years. Right. So, beginning in chapter 21, we looked at the implications of capital gains, capital losses, and we looked at the different rates applicable for individuals with respect to capital gains. Um, and then we defined what is a capital asset, right? David, um, what code section David dictates? You remember? You have your summary of code sections, Andy. And you have your summary of code sections handy? I think it's 1222. You're close, minus one. 1221. 1221, right? Gives us a definition of what is a capital asset. And we said for our purposes, uh, Brian, what are capital assets? Um, almost anything. Except? Uh, inventory, um, 1231 assets. And? Uh, okay. I mean, it's broader, but the whole world consists of tax exempt, excuse me, the whole world consists of capital assets with certain limitations. And those limitations are, there's several, but the most important ones are inventory is probably the number one. 1231 assets, those are assets that you send a trade or business, and accounts receivable. Obviously, there's others, but um, those are the three that crop up the most. The authors then discuss, remember, and maybe this is what Dan was referring to, Code Section 1222 describes what are long-term and short-term capital gains and losses in the netting process. 
Um, and to fit within the parameters of Code Section 1222, three conditions must be met. There must be a sale or exchange, capital asset, and held for more than one year. So the authors then describe <coughs> that what is a sale or exchange, and sometimes, many times you'll know what a sale or exchange is. Sometimes you'll need a little help from the government. <coughs> so for example, in Hudson v. Commissioner, the retirement of debt was not considered an exchange, but Congress always gets the final word on these things. Congress revisited this, and in Section 1271, Congress added to the code to provide the requisite um, sale or exchange. Holding period, we learned, begins vis-a-vis Revenue Rolling 66-7, the day after acquisition. And that the important date is Revenue Rolling 66-97 is the trade date, not the settlement date. Trade date, not the settlement date. Um, there are several cases that we looked at that put some spin on, again, what is a sale or exchange and characterizing gains and losses with the sale, for example, of lottery winnings. We, we looked at those cases. We looked at the Aerosmith Doctrine correlation with prior transactions and um, also sculling oil. And on page 745, there's a discussion of several different code sections in which <coughs> Congress, in some cases, was um, very magnanimous, gave a pro-tax <coughs> outcome, and in some cases, Congress proved to be a little bit stingy and did not give such favorable treatment. So um, we have a whole series of code sections there. Um, we left off on page 750. And I was going to begin today the discussion of code section 1231. Our goal line, let me just state this. Our goal line is to finish chapter 21, which shouldn't be a problem, complete chapter 22, which shouldn't be a problem. And that should put us in good shape, I hope, for the exam next week. Now, um, I will say this, that I will be around the entire week, so if you get caught up and anything in your notes looks confusing, uh, you should reach out to me, send me an email, and run by you know, whatever your notes say, you can say, hey, I thought it made sense at the time, but my notes in this particular place doesn't make sense for reasons A, B, or C. Or if you're going through one of the study guides um, and there's a particular problem, and the problem doesn't seem to jive with something I've said, let me try to uh, shed light on that. Um, any questions logistically, just keep in mind, it's an open book, open note exam. What you can't bring is anything electronic except for a simple calculator. So you cannot use your cell phone as a calculator. You cannot have an Apple Watch or its equivalent. Um, so that's the only thing I ask. And also if you can use the restroom beforehand, uh, that'd be terrific. There's too many people to have, and if you have an issue, send me an email, just explain it. But my preference is that everyone hang out here for the exam, two and a half hours for the exam, all right? And if you can, it's imperative that you show up at 6 o'clock, because we will begin at 6 o'clock and end promptly at 8.30. So if you think that there may be traffic, because tonight, as you know, many of you, it's Columbus Day, and the traffic was relatively light. Uh, but as we all know, every Monday is not Columbus Day. So uh, be forewarned that you know, next week traffic will be in brutal self. So plan appropriately. Uh, any questions or issues? Uh, let me just give a quick plug, uh, and then we'll get into this material. Um, I sent out an email, is that every year I host a tax event, and, um, and I'll be a little biased here, is that every year 
it's memorable. Yeah, that can cut both ways. Uh, good and bad. Um, but it really has, we've had um, magicians, we've had all sorts of people come and perform, and uh, I've been very fortunate. I've never had a hypnotist, if you got my email. Did everyone get my email, I hope? Yeah. All right. So, and aside from hopefully what will be fun to see, um, we have two very good speakers, people who, if you're participating in the tax program, um, or, or people inevitably will take uh, Professor Ted Kwok and Alan Kornstein, and there are two great topics that are the hottest thing in tax now, opportunity zones in Code Section 199A. So seriously consider coming not only to hobnob with people, uh, but and, and come see this hypnotist who I, I don't know could be or different, uh, but also because the two speakers I know personally, and I'm sure I'm anxious to hear what they have to say on the two topics. I can promise you it will be relevant to your practice. <coughs> so it, it, to me, it's a no-brainer. Uh, I hope to share my opinion. I hope I see you. I hope I see your significant other, or spouse, whatever you want, whomever you want to bring. And for some of the people who are part of the professional accounting program or not part of the tax program, uh, it's still a great opportunity to network with some some interesting people from all different firms. So uh, those people uh, who are part of the professional accounting program. I hope they consider it too. Any questions about Friday, November 9th? It's going to be right here. It should be relatively <coughs> easy. You guys have parking. You should have parking. So it should be relatively easy. Uh, and it will not be a late night. So, uh, and like I said, there's a story in the making there. And no, I will not volunteer for the hypnotist. But uh, aside from that, maybe one of you will, or a few of you will. Anything else? Any other questions? Is it a few? Say again, Valerie? Is it free events or not? It's not a free event because my experience with free events is everyone's enthusiast, enthusiastic until the night up. And then if it drizzles or there's a little wind, um, then no one shows up. So it's a to me it's a minor financial commitment. You get for those who are CPAs, it's, you get one hour of C E credit and dinner and entertainment for thirty-five dollars. I challenge you to go to a movie and uh, do it for less, okay? So, uh, but this way people show up, okay? So it's not, if people said they were gonna come and we could get away with it, I wouldn't charge, but I, I just know that in years past that if you make it free, 80% uh, of the people who say they're coming don't come for one reason or another. Does that mean you're All right, you'll have to, a anyone who didn't get the email, during the break, if you can, talk to me, because that means you're not going to listen. And that's a problem. All right? All right. Page 750. All right. Code section 1231. You may want to open it in your code. Section 1231 gains for any taxable year do not exceed the Section 1231 losses. Such gains and losses shall not be treated as gains and losses when they sell or change in capital assets. Ergo, they would be ordinary. Capital asset. 
Yeah. And the answer is yes, because it's sort of like heads you win, tails you win. What's the cliche? Heads you win, tails you win, or heads I win, tails you lose. Exactly. Thank you. It's been a long day. Tails I win, heads I win, tails you lose. Okay? At least from the government's perspective, right? Because you're going to get capital gains if there's gains. You're going to do ordinary losses if there are losses. Music to your ears because theoretically you don't have to suffer or your clients do not have to endure capital loss limitation rules, right? Under Code Section 1211. So that's music to your clients' ears, right? But I think I emphasize that you need, you need to embrace a particular characteristic. Upper tier Dave, Dave, do you remember that, what that characteristic is? Sure, not sure. Corey, remember what I mentioned towards the end of class? What you should do akin to your interpersonal relationships? Say again, David? Patience. Patience, right? Because when it comes to 1231, you can't evaluate the outcome or predict the outcome until you know at the end of the tax year if the gains exceed the losses or the losses exceed the gains. Does everyone agree? Okay. You can't know that in advance. All right? So we're going to exercise patience. Now, 1231 is subject to two exceptions, I think, again. It was the very end of class. I brought this or tried to bring this to attention. Uh, Patrick, do you remember what one of the two exceptions might be? Chat. This is uh, Abbott, you know? Right? So, with this one, it's about involuntary conversions. 
the issue here runs, you do this hodgepodge before you do the main hodgepodge. Let's call it the sub hodgepodge. Sorry. You do this sub hodgepodge before you do the main hodgepodge. So you look at all of your involuntary conversions first, figure out if you get net uh, capital gain or an offer, sorry, not off, a loss, and then that number would go into the main hodgepodge. So is this pro taxpayer or not pro taxpayer? And if so, why is it one versus the other? I would think it's pro taxpayer. Why? Because you're getting the benefit of the ordinary loss in total if you have a net loss. Well, in these circumstances, the people it's have a net yeah. loss. Say so again? These are, these are typically losses. So if you get ordinary treatment for all those losses, it's unlikely to get capital. But how does that distinguish from 1231 losses where you get ordinary losses? Well, because here now, any some of those capital gains that you may have had are going to be netted in total, so you wouldn't have to pay. Um, like if you had a capital of five and you had an operating with a loss of 20, here now you're putting the net, the net 15 loss into the main hub. I'm not sure if everyone's going to follow you. Does anyone want to add any points of clarification for Mike's point? No points of clarification? Can I? Then take, take the podium. I guess I am theoretically at the podium. Um, all right. So 1231A 4C, let me start off, is a pro taxpayer provision. Why? Because in situations where things are bleak and the taxpayer suffered a loss, it goes into the sub hodgepodge as a result of fire, theft, involuntary conversion. And here, the taxpayer is going to have an ordinary loss, even if his other 1231 gains are positive. So the taxpayer could have a situation where the taxpayer has a positive 1231 gain, and it would result in a capital gain, right? Everyone agree? 1231 main hodgepodge gain, capital gain. But the sub hodgepodge yields a loss and the taxpayer can command ordinary loss treatment. So normally, taxpayers do the weighing process, and if, it's cap if the gains exceed the losses, everything's capital, right? Even the losses. But here, the taxpayer can have a foot in both worlds. But simultaneously, the taxpayer can have a capital gain and an ordinary loss. What's the bridge to get there? Code section 1231A4C, right? So this is a pro-taxpayer provision. Second exception. All right, did Jonah? Jonah? Yeah, there it is. Second? Yes. And for Francis? Uh, David? Matt? Matt, is that a yes, no? Uh, yes, so it's 1231C. Okay. This establishes a look back recapture rule. And that says that even if you have a 1231 gain on the year, but you have prior 1231 losses, uh, then that gain can be embedded against those prior losses. So what's the upshot for the client, for the taxpayer? As a result of 1231C, which is the second exception, what's the upshot? Matt? Uh, you know that you're offsetting some gains that you have. Does it change the numerical outcome now? No. Frank, do you agree or disagree? If you're offsetting, I think it does. Say so again? If you're offsetting, I think it does. Angel, who's right? Ben, you were going to comment? Uh, it won't change the numerical value, it just changes the character of it. All right, that's key. I just want to make sure. I, I, I pushed your heart on that, Matt. And Frank, just uh, testing you guys. Um, 
And this is a common mistake students make, very common. They change the numerical outcome as a result of applying Position 1231C. But that is not what you should do. It should not change the numerical outcome. Okay, the numerical outcome should remain the same. All it does is it changes the character from what might otherwise be capital gain into ordinary income. So you look back the last five years, and to the extent you have 1231 losses, you look at the current year to the extent you haven't recharacterized in prior years, and I'll explain in a moment what that means, is the current year you recharacterize as ordinary income. So in a very simple example, in the year 2017 and 2018, suppose you had um, $100 worth of 1231 losses. All right, great, $100. Um, and how would that Kim be characterized? If you had $100 worth of 1231 losses, what would be the character? It would be ordinary, right? If the losses exceed the gain. So this would be $100 worth of ordinary losses. Agree? Yes. And this year, suppose we had 125 of 1231 gains. Angie, what would be the income? And Valerie, see if you agree with Angie. How would you treat the 125? Um, so. Just say it loudly because. Yes. So would you consider a gain of 25 and then we would offset 25? So what would you report? What would you tell your client to report, Angie? Is it capital? Please? Just tell me numerically and then tell me the character. Valerie, right or wrong? For those in the back, Angie said 25 capital gain. Valerie? You're, you're just nodding. Is that a guess? I know when it gets seen, it's all capital. So, okay. Jacqueline? I have no idea. Right? That uh, would be 25 capital. Uh, Annie, would you agree or disagree? I agree. You agree with Brian? Right. Angie, you made a great mistake, but tonight that's a great mistake. Next week it will be, it'll be a sad mistake, okay? All right, so don't listen to what Angie did. She changed, Angie, right? You changed the numerical outcome. Correct. Right. And Matt will tell you, upper tier Matt will tell you, never, ever, right? Matt changed the numerical outcome. Never. Ever. 1231C does not change the numerical outcome. It changes the character. Right, Valerie? So the answer here is 100 would be recharacterized as ordinary income. The remaining 25 would be a capital gain. Why? Because to the extent of prior year's losses, you recharacterize the 125. Suppose we had. In 2016, we had uh, $100 worth of losses again. Okay? Everyone got that? $100 worth of losses, right? Kim, what's the character of that 2016 loss? Um, Just whispering. Say again? 100,000 of uh, ordinary losses. Ordinary losses. Okay, 100,000. My guess. What's the character of the 2018? Income. It would all be ordinary. Would you agree, EK? That's yeah, sure. Leo? Uh, I agree. So, what would you tell your client to report? Well, wouldn't you report to zero for the time you have for two years? Nick, would you, what would you tell your client to report? So, Leo, you're not going to change the numerical outcome, right? Yes, yes, or you're going to kill me. You're going to kill yourself. All right? Everybody agree you will not change the numerical outcome? Yes. Please. 
I want everyone to do well next week. This is not going to bode well. You know, you've got to pay attention, okay? Leo, you're not changing your numerical output. So when I look back, I have $200 worth of taint, right? 1231 losses constitute taint going forward because it taints what otherwise might be capital gain and transforms it into ordinary income, right? So this becomes all 125 becomes ordinary income. Right, Angie, we didn't change the numerical outcome. Just change the character. Okay. Now. All right, Joe. I have a question. Why is the hundred dollars an ordinary loss and not capital loss? Because 1231, if the losses exceed the gains, it's all ordinary. Oh, right, 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 right. Okay? If you're losing the potential rate, I mean, how is it for tax payer? What do you mean? Hold on, hold on. This 1231C is not pro tax payer. 1231A4C is pro taxpayer. This is not pro taxpayer. Different code section. Now, given my fact pattern, I just added this, okay? Kathy, what's the character in 2015 of that? What's the character? So I hear you. No, I just said that wrong. Huh? Sarah. Right. Did I say that right? Yes, yeah, Sarah. Sarah, right? Yeah. I'm practicing. Sarah, agree or disagree? Yeah, <laughs> and uh, final word on this, Anna? Yeah, we're going to marry In 2015. This 1231 game. Miles? I agree. Why? Okay, let me just say, Francis, you're going to say? Why? Yeah, guys, the gains exceed the losses. I know that. It's 175 the capital gain. What's the confusion? Can you just go back to the beginning? Just explain the whole concept one more time. If the gains exceed the losses, everything's capital. If the losses exceed the gains, everything's ordinary. So here it's 300 gain. Right. Who said 300 gain? Where did you see 300? 125, 170. Right. I'm talking about the year 2015 alone, Miles. What's the character in 2015? I don't know the future. Do you? Oh, so that's capital all along. What do you mean it's all along? All along. It's alone. Alone. This one year is capital gain. 175? Yes. Everyone agree? Yes. You guys up for this? Don't say it out loud. Everyone write down in 2018 what is the character of the 125. Given now we know Miles the future. It's the year 2018. We know what happened in the past. Well, we don't know the future. We certainly know what happened in the past. What is the character of the 125? Just write it out, jot it down, commit yourself, put it in pen. Carla, you got a number? No. Rebel? If you go back, I mean, you have to. Don't tell me if you go back, just tell me 125. With the least three years, 125, you can have 25 as your uh, ordinary 100 as your capital gain. So you say 25 ordinary, 100 capital gain. Right? But I just do not understand why would you want to go back and pay. You don't have a choice. You don't have a choice. It's not a choice. Who disagrees? Who agrees? Anyone disagree? Has everyone agreed? Uh, well, nailed this. Say again. What was his answer? Hundred thousand. Say again. Your answer to Ralph. So you have basically negative twenty-five dollars um, loss, right? 
it's um, loss can convert that twenty five dollars from the time. What do you mean loss? There's no loss carry forward, so be careful what you say. What's going to happen to the income in 2016, guys? Oh. What's the character? Loss. Ordinary. Ordinary. ordinary loss. Huh? This is ordinary loss, okay? What's the character here? Ordinary. Ordinary. What's the character here? Why is it capital? So look back. It's a portion. What do you mean capital? You look back. You let, where there's losses, right? 200. All 125 would be ordinary income again. You look five years. But we only started business in 2015. Suppose in 2019, I'm going to tell you the future, Miles. We earned $200. Okay? We earned $200. Okay, you guys are on a roll. Uh, Nick, this day. Character, the 200. And Matt, next to you on your left. 75 ordinary income, 125 capital. Matt? I'm honestly not sure. David? Andrew? <coughs> yeah, Andrew. Ben? You got it. You got it? You got it. Okay. Let's do this. We know this 125 becomes ordinary, right? Because when we look back, we have $200 worth of taint, right? Yeah. So all 125 becomes ordinary. The next year, we've used up 125 of the 200. There's 75 of the taint that remains, right? Are we in agree? There's 75 taint that remains. So this 200, 75 is ordinary income. The balance, or 125, becomes capital gain. So, Professor, why didn't you consider the 175? We don't consider the 175 because when we look back, we look at the losses. We don't look at the gains. We don't net them. This they got capital gains. It's not part of the equation. We look at it as ordinary, right? We would. I mean, I, I can make it more complicated, but I don't want to get there with 2014 being a loss year, and we recharacterize part of it. Well, we'll get to this. We'll get more. Joe? For 2018, the 125, you said ordinary. Do you mean ordinary loss? Or no, ordinary income. It's a, don't change. It's income. Ordinary income, but it's recharacterized because of 1231C. But 1231C, think about the purpose. Why did Congress put 1231C in the code? Right? Time purpose. What? Well, if, if 1231C wasn't in the code. Time everything. Right. I would advise my client, if 1231C wasn't in the code, take losses one year, get ordinary loss treatment, and then take your gains the next year and get capital gain treatment, right? Isn't that really getting the best of both worlds? And 1231C says, no, you can't play that game. We're going to have a netting process. So essentially, it puts you in the same position as if you netted. Suppose I put these in the same tax year. What would have happened if this happened in the same tax year? We had 100 of loss, 125 of gains, guys. What would we have? And what, what would be the character capital? Capital. Everyone agree? Gains would exceed losses. This would be 100 capital loss, 125 capital gain. That's the purpose of 1231C, is it eliminates taxpayers gaming the system by strategically taking losses in one year, gains in another. So the 125 is ordinary gain. Yeah, in this case it is. Ordinary because you look back, in this case, only two years where there's losses, and then 200 of prior losses, Causes all 125 to be treated as ordinary income. Back. And then, is that five years from the year that you're looking at? Yeah, you look back here and then go back five years. Including that year? Or no. Five, five prior years. As long as you have losses in those five years. Yeah, if you don't have losses, there's a moot issue. Francis? Why five years? Because the code says so. 
Not because I think so, but because Section 1231 is safe. All right? So this makes for excitement. And it's also, you don't mind me saying, suppose you're going to lunch. It's a Friday, or you're going to the shore, and you get that quick email from a client who says, oh, I got $200 worth of 1231 games. And you're anxious to get out because your friends are waiting for you for lunch, right? And you want to be the hero, so you want to shoot a quick email out to your client and say, oh, that's a capital gain. You owe me dinner. And off to lunch you go, and the taxpayer reports capital gain. And years later, two years later, the taxpayer is audited, and the IRS comes back and says, oh, you owe interest and penalties because it should have been two years ordinary income because it's 1231C. And there's an, there's an email from you saying reported as a capital gain. It is not a good day in the office. Because your client is saying, oh, you have to pay me the interest and penalties or else I'm suing you. So just be careful because temptation works if you forget to use the 1231C look back, right? You want to agree? You get real ugly quickly in your office. All right? Any questions? Well, we're going to go through problems and hopefully we're going to clear up any confusion you have. We're going to make you perfect at this. All right? All right. There's this small case here, Wozniak. Okay? Wozniak um, deals with an issue of what is a 1231 asset? What is a 1231 asset? And it's an asset used in a trade or business. In the Wozniak case, taxpayer owned one piece of rental property. Did that constitute a trade or business where it was a 1231 asset? The court held yes, that the rental of one property alone made that real estate a 1231 asset. And because it was a 1231 asset, and because there was a loss, what is the character of the loss? Ordinary. And because it was an ordinary loss, in this case, it was the IRS or here that it was a 1231 loss because the loss then disappeared. Where it, it had it been a capital loss, the taxpayer could have carried it forward. So here it was to the I, to the taxpayer's disadvantage to have a 1231 loss, but nevertheless it was considered such. Okay? So not a hard case to follow. Um, and, and the authors point out, not all courts agree. If you look on page 757, um, there's a case holding the exact opposite. So this is not definitive that one piece of property constitutes a trade or business, but um, it, it, these are difficult issues. Uh, don't look for a multiple choice question on that. Page 758, there is a further case to read, Williams v. McGowan. It's a well-known case, but it's a well-known case, hard to read, but it stands for a simple proposition. If you sell a business, suppose you represent a local, um, a local store uh, at the bodega that sells uh, fruits and vegetables, okay? It's not incorporated. You sell a proprietorship, and it has cash registers, it has food stamps, all that stuff. Do you sell the, and when you look at capital assets under Code Section 1221, notice the word business doesn't appear, right? So you might say to yourself, gee, I'm selling my business, it's a capital asset because it doesn't fall, it's not inventory, it's not asset use in a trader business, it's not accounts receivable, I'm selling my business. I should get capital gain treat. Well, Williams B. McGowan says, no, 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 not so quick. When you sell a business, you're not selling the whole enterprise. You're selling asset by asset by asset. And because you're selling asset by asset by asset, you have to break it down and look at the assets individually so that you're selling inventory, you're selling goodwill, you're selling other assets. And you've got to look at each asset you're selling, not the business as a whole. Michael? Is this only, in this case specifically, is it only because his partner died so it was no longer a partnership and he was selling the whole business. Had this just been his partnership interest, you would have had the same result. Yes, you would have had the same outcome because partnerships are dictated by 
Code Section 741 and 751, there's two different code sections at play. And those two different code sections give rise to capital gain and ordinary income. So essentially, partnerships too, when you sell a membership interest or partnership interest, you don't just get capital gain. It starts, Code Section 741 starts off with it being capital gain, but then 751 carves out ordinary income assets. So the outcome is the same. Okay, so I know some of you are at the edge of your seat, you're nervous, like, I get some of this, I don't get all of this, all right? We're about to put it, we're about to make you feel better, I think, I hope. Page 761, let's see if we do this. All right, are you ready? Let's hold hands, we can do it together. Um, let's make sure everyone knows this. Let's look at the problems here. We have a taxpayer with the name Hodgepodge. Oh, speaking of which, if you get a chance, I did see, I don't know, I wanted to see, some of you probably saw if you're in the majority, but I did not. Who saw a, a Star is Born? Anyone? Anyone? Okay, Gashiel, give us a review. Uh, I actually just saw it yesterday. It was pretty good. Uh, I cried a little bit. Okay. Uh, so. and, and you know what gets me irritated about that movie? Really irritated? I don't know about you guys. How can anyone look like uh, Bradley Cooper and sing as well? I yeah, mean, right. is life fair? <laughs> can I ask you, is life fair? Well, you learned that just for that movie. You can't play guitar and sing. Literally, just I mean, I could learn it, but I, can't, I, I couldn't sing it, you know, unless I get a voice transplant. So, good for him. I mean, I did see him. I, I, I figured I had the wings of Brownie Point, so I took I like to see Elephant Man in, in Broadway when Brad, Bradley was playing it. Um, and it's kind of interesting to take probably one of the best looking human beings and try to make him into one of the most ugly looking human beings. So it, it, it was quite the feat to pull that off. But I did see the movie um, Mr. Rogers, Welcome to the Neighborhood documentary. I don't know if any of you, it's an interesting movie. Um, there's a person who deserves sainthood, it, it, it appears he made five for that, for that role. Uh, if you haven't seen it, interesting movie. All right, um, so let's do a hodgepodge engage in the following transactions. Determine separately for each part, A through I, how the matters indicated will be characterized in the current year. Assuming in all other parts other than J through I, the 1231C is inapplicable. So we're not gonna, we're gonna ignore 1231C uh, for the moment, I know that you know many of you are going to find that disturbing. You'll survive, okay? Um, hodgepodge, sell some land, use in his business for four years for twenty thousand, cost him ten thousand. He also received sixteen thousand uh, when the state condemned some land, other land he had purchased for uh, eighteen thousand three years ago, uh, which he had leased to a third person. So in question A, we have land one and land two. Okay, let's get the numerical part right. Gain or loss on land one. Let's just quickly go through this. Jacqueline, Angie, gain or loss on land one. It's not challenging. Land one, guys, gain of how much? How much? 10,000. Gain or loss on, year on land two. Loss of how much? 2,000. 2, okay? Now we need to know character. Michelle, you're on a roll with, let's see if your star is born right here, right now. Michelle, <laughs> gain or loss? Second group, deep Is there, is, what is the character of these? Oh. Uh, the gain. Well, I know it's a gain, but just tell me the character. Uh, it would be capital. Amanda, is the star born to your left? Um, everything would be classified as capital gains. So are you being nice and not saying a star is born? <laughs> Gory, who's right? Um, I agree with her. It's all capital. It's all capital, right? A shield, gains exceed losses, it's all capital. So this is a capital gain, this is a capital loss. Okay, everyone agree? Because the gains here exceed the losses. B, same as A, except that both pieces of land were inherited from Hodgepodge's uncle who died three months before the dispositions, okay? 
So code section 1014 may be applied. We don't know. I mean, we know. When he died, it did. And uncle's death, the business land was worth 16, and the lease land was worth 18. So is there any gain or loss on land one? Ronald? Uh, yes. Uh, six. How'd you get that? Um, cost of 10. Well, how much did he sell land one for? He's selling it for 20, right? What's his basis in it? His, uh, his What's his basis? When he sold it? Yeah. It was 10. Where did you see that? Uh, it cost him 10 to buy it, so it's... Well, he's dead. <coughs> so, didn't, didn't it, uh, wasn't it inherited? So, my guess, what's the basis? Uh, 16,000. Right, code section 1014, right, Ron? So, gain or loss here, Mike? Gain. How much? 4,000. Okay, EK on land two, gain or loss? Loss. So how much? 2,000. Okay. Now, 1231 property has to be held for more than one year. If you read the definition of 1231B, it says the property must be held for more than one year. EK, is this 1231 property? Mike? No. You sure, Leo? Job on the line now? What do we know? Andrew? Uh, I remember correctly when somebody dies, that property is considered uh, long. Yeah, code section 1223.9, you learned it last week, right? Mm -hmm. A taxpayer's, with respect to holding period of death, you're automatically the recipient has a long term holding period, right? <coughs> so here go, it is a 1231 asset even though it was only held for three months, right? Everyone agree? Yes. So it is a 1231 asset. So in this case, uh, John, is it, uh, what's the character, John? Uh, should be ordinary. Why? What's your rationale? Okay, now you can second guess yourself, but not next week, okay? The gains here exceed the losses, so we're back to capital gain, capital loss, long term. And we're good? We're on a roll. Question C. Oshbud sells the building, uh, used several years in his business, which he depreciated under straight line method. The sales price is 15, and the adjusted basis is 5. His two year old car used exclusively in business, damn it, was totally destroyed in a fire, right? He's not a happy camper. The car had a $6,000 adjusted basis, was worth $8,000 prior to the fire, he received $4,000 from insurance proceeds. So we have a building and we have a car. On the building, on the building, um, name, date or loss. 10,000. Alvin, what about the car? Joe, car? Angel, car? Angel, car? Say again? Frank, agree, disagree? Uh, I disagree. What do you say? Matt, who's right? Hmm. I'm going to agree with the loss of 2000 Okay, it's a loss of 2000 right? <clears throat> Look at the amount received for the insurance proceeds and the adjusted basis. The loss of 2000 Miles, what's the character? Capital because A exceeds the loss. Is that right, Anna? I'm talking about the building and the car. The car is... No, you're the building the game. Say again? The building has a game. Building has a game. Keep going. And the car 
Murray's laws. So what do you say the answer is here? Kathy, you get final words. Yeah, I think it's capital gain. Uh, I lied up. Jason, you get the final word. Um, the building is a capital gain, the car is a mortar I lost. Why? Because it's an involuntary. Um, oh, we have a sub hodgepodge. Everybody agree? We have a sub hodgepodge. Something terrible happened. Congress feels very magnanimous. We better, this is a capital gain, right? But this is a sub-hodgepodge because if you look at 1231A4C, this loss resulted from a fire. So it's ordinary loss, and this is a capital gain. So this is one of the few instances, right, Miles, where you don't just do the weighing process because we have the prefix sub, right? The prefix sub-hodgepodge. This is part of the sub-hodgepodge, right? EK, okay, you got that? Fall 31, A, 4, C. Andrew, you got that? Yeah. Definitely. Yes. Nick? Yep. All right, I like the... I was thinking it, I was thinking it, but then I kind of thought maybe it's total capital gains, but then, <coughs> you know, I picked the wrong one. All right, but be careful. Roulette's kind of dangerous game. <laughs> All right, question D. Everyone got this. I'm going to pause. It's not extraordinary It's under the code. It's, it look at code section. Well, it doesn't use the phraseology extraordinary circumstance. In the case of any involuntary conversion, it defines arising from fire, storm, shipwreck, or other casualties, right? So it can't be, you know, we can't define our own circumstance. Here, you know, it arose because of these events. Hurricane Florence would be a storm last I checked, right? What's the new storm coming to the Gulf of Me uh, Mexico? Michael. 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 Okay. Question D. Uh, professor? Yes. Can I really quick, like, make confused between hodgepodge and some hodgepodge. Okay, tell me your confusion. Hodgepodge means a big pot. And the big pot, you see if the gains exceed the losses, and the losses exceed your gains, right? Okay. So you got a big pot on the stove. Sub hodgepodge is a little pot. It's for really tragic events, Joe. Okay. And in that case, if the losses in the little pot exceed the gains, you get ordinary loss treatment. And that's what happened here, right? That? Could you have a net? Could you have a gain? Oh, the way, that hold, hold your thought. I think the next problem covers it. Question D. In addition to the building and corn C above, assume that Hodgepodge had a painting that he purchased two years ago, which was held in connection with his business, in which, damn it, was also destroyed by a fire. Okay? So, got two tragic events here, right, Matt? Okay? The painting had been purchased for $4,000 and he received $8,000 in insurance proceeds. So, question D. We have a building. We have a car and we have a painting, right? And we know how to apply code section 1001, right? You guys are all experts. So, Matt, just tell me the gains and losses here, Matt. So you get your main gain of, what was it, 10,000? And then you have the loss from, the sub loss from the car, which is 2,000. And then you have the sub gain from the painting, which is 4,000. So your sub, you have the sub gain. I'm not trying to over it. Okay, so on that point, Joe, is a picture of you all two pots. Everyone got, okay? You got pot one, and you have a potential pot here, right? Potential pot, sub pods, pot, right? Potentially, right? But let's look at 1231A4C together. It says in the case of any involuntary conversion, then it has a parenthetical rising from storm. Uh, or from fire, storm, shipwreck, or other casualty, or from death of any property, use, or trade, or business, or any capital asset. <coughs> da, da, da. This subsection shall not apply to such conversion, uh, whether resulting in gain or loss, if during the taxable year the recognized losses from such conversion exceed the recognized gains. 
Matt, do the recognized losses exceed the gains? Yes. What? No, no, sorry. <laughs> I'm looking at this little pot, right, Joe? Right, Matt? I'm looking at the little pot. The gains here exceed the losses. As, as a bleeding heart liberal, maybe, do you feel as badly for this person as you did in this problem? And the answer is, in the sub pods, you don't, because you know what? They were really well insured, right? And as a result of this horrific fire, they actually made money. Guess what? There is no sub pods, Podge. Miles, you there? You got that? I'm writing it down. There's a difference between writing it down and getting it. You got it? There is no sub hodgepodge, Joe. So the sub hodgepodge is only for. Poof! Disappear. It's only for bad events. And there is no bad event here. <coughs> now, Joe, I gotta put you on the spot. Let's see if you and Bradley are 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 equals here. Joe, tell us the character of this income. And then uh Perla, see if you agree with Joe. I'm waiting. Just, I'll write it down whatever you tell me, Joe, because I'll throw this stuff. What? Capital gain. Capital gain? Meaning the gains exceed the losses here. Everyone agree? So it's all capital. It is all capital because the gains exceed. And there's no sub hodgepodge. So you have 14 uh, capital gain, 2 capital loss? Yeah. Okay. Truly on a roll here. Question E. In addition to the building sale, car loss and painting gain and C and D. About the assume Hodgepodge sells land for selling years in his business for thirty thousand. The land he hoped contained oil had been purchased for fifty thousand dollars. Okay. So we have building, we have car, we have painting, we have land. On the land, gain or loss, guys? Loss. loss of how much? How much? 20. <coughs> okay, David, Dan, Brian. David, you get the first shot. Character. Ordinary loss. So, what would you say as they go down here? You just make this all wood in there. Yeah. Dan agree or disagree? I think I agree. Right? I agree. All right. Guys, this would all be ordinary. Ordinary income. Ordinary loss. Ordinary income. Ordinary loss. Why? The losses exceed the gains, right? You got that, Miles? Feeling good? Feeling right? See, when you really hit it with tax, there's this very, very warm feeling you get. Okay? Like uh, drinking hot cocoa on a cold winter day. All right. Now, um, question F. Would Hodgepodge be pleased if commissioners successfully alleged that the land and property was held as an investment rather than used in his business? Okay, so let's just do this building, car, uh, painting, land. And we know the numbers under Code Section 1001. That's not a mystery, right? 10, 2, 4, uh, 20. But now the commissioner would like to say this is not a 1231 asset, right? 
It's an asset use and it's an investment. So Patrick and Dane, you guys get the honors. And I would chime, chime in. How would your answer change here? I think it would be a negative thing because the 20,000 would turn into a capital loss now. Patrick, agree or disagree? Abbott? I'm going to go the opposite and say it's a good thing because it turns into a capital loss. It's a good thing, I'm sorry? Because it turns into a capital loss now. Why, why is it a good thing? You can carry it forward. Yeah, but people, your clients aren't going to get the warm cubbies about carrying losses forward, right? Because it's a 1211, they'd rather use it currently, right? So that's not a good thing. And what ends up happening is this is taken out of the main hodgepodge, right, Joe? It's out, out, out of the fire, right? It's out of the main pot because it's not part of the 1231 hodgepodge, right? So this is an investment. There's a loss. It's a capital asset, right? So it's a capital loss. What about these other items? What happens? Dean, Gator, Patrick, what's the character of this, these three items there? Capital. Okay, so this is a capital gain, capital loss, it's capital gain, right? But overall, it's when you do the arithmetic, it will result in an $8,000 capital loss, right? When you put these all together now, your client's not going to be happy with an $8,000 capital loss, right? Because the 12, Code Section 1211 limitation will limit them to $3,000 of the $8,000, and they have to carry forward under Code Section 1212 the five. Five dollars, or five thousand, or five hundred thousand. So, because you converted the twenty k into capital loss, everything else is capital. Well, not because of this, but now this is in the main pot, and the gains exceed the losses. Not because of this, but just because of our normal twelve thirty one. Um, right, Joe. Question G, what result under D above? Um, so we're going back to problem D. In four years before the fire, Hodgepod had five, so let's go back. Suppose this, what, what is the character here overall, guys, right? This is $12,000 of capital gain, everyone agree? <coughs> And it's supposed that it happened in 2018. $12,000 capital gain. So we have 2017, 2016, 2015, and 2014, right? And we're asked here that we're told here that four years before, we go one, two, three, four. Um, we had a five thousand dollar twelve thirty one loss, and three years before um, we had a three thousand, and no other twelve thirty one loss. Okay, everybody had the visual here. What's wrong, Elizabeth? I guess it's negative five negative. Yep, negative five negative three. What happens in 2018? I need to know. Ever see the movie Dirty Harry? The very last scene? I need to know. Okay. If you've seen the movie, you'll relate. If you haven't seen the movie, you'll relate. All right. Uh, John, I'll go back up to you and okay, then see if you agree with John. What's the character? Uh, it's going to be $8,000 uh, ordinary, $4,000 capital. Okay. Thumbs up. You got it. When you recarry, we do not change for any case the numerical outcome. <coughs> numerical outcome is still 12. 8,000 of which normally this would all be capital gain, right? But because of the taint of prior years, 8,000 is going to be ordinary income, 4,000 capital gain. Question H. Same. 8,000 is what? Ordinary. 8,000 ordinary, 4,000 capital gain. Wow. 
Question eight. Block four. You had, I thought he had 14. No, 12. Oh, sorry. No, 12. Question eight. Same as G, except that two years before, Hodgepodge had a 6,000. Okay? 6,000. So, Vikram, how would you choose the 12? And Nick, see if you agree. Vikram. Okay, Nick, create this group. Nick, ordinary. Paul, Andy, agree with this. It's all ordinary, right? Big room. We have a lot of taint here. We have 14,000 in taint. We have 12,000, all 12,000, then we recharacterize as ordinary income. Right? You've got to be careful. Question nine. Same as H, except that one year before the tax year, get a 10,000, gain. All right, Miles, let's see if you're really know your stuff. Jason, see if you agree with Miles. Miles, how do we treat the 12? Um, we're going to treat it as uh, the loss of the greater than the gains, right? Just say it loudly. So loss of the greater than the gains, right? I'm just going to, I just want to know what I should do in 2018. We're going to do four of ordinary and eight of capital. Jason? Be careful the way you cut four, I mean four ordinary and um yeah. Well, so the way you started, I got a little bit nervous because oh, I was just talking through it myself. Uh, all right. Um all right, everybody agree? How 2017, this is all gonna be treated as ordinary, right? Because we have we already decided that we have um 15,000 attained. That 14,000 a taint is going to make this all ordinary income, right? We're going to absorb 10 to the 14, which leaves four taint still around, right, Jonah? And that means four is ordinary, eight is capital. All right. Any questions? Because you know, whether it be on the midterm or final, or in practice, you're going to see these kind of questions come up. Michael? For the earlier questions, 10 capital, so it's number one. Uh, 10 capital gain, 2 capital loss. Would you ever net those? Or? Yeah, you can, but for exam purposes, don't. Let me see what you did. Francis? I didn't get the code section for 1B. What was the beginning? I mean, it's just 1231A. Yeah, it says if the gains exceed the losses, it's all capital. Right? Yeah. I, think, I think she means in terms of uh, taking the basis from past time. That's 1014. 1014. Yeah. 1014. Yeah. Good question. The condemned land wouldn't qualify as. Uh, no. It's got to, it, if you look at it, it's got to arise from those events. The condemnation in problem 1A does not qualify for sub to treatment. Good question, but it doesn't fall. The backup on the um, transfer holding period is 12.239. Yeah. It says that it's when it's long term. Transferred to you by death, it's automatically long term, no matter the time period. Yeah. Other questions? People have, a few of you have asked me um, how to study, and I, I said this from day one. Um, certainly going through your notes, outlining. Uh, trying to hone in on the code section is useful, but there are many uh, books out there that have sample problems uh, that you can buy for a dollar. Does not you do not need the latest edition. Notwithstanding the changes in the tax law, you guys are learning the fundamentals. These precepts have they transcend time. They really have not changed marketably over the last decade or two. So my message is, um, I recommended from day one that you consider getting a question and answer box. Uh, there's a black letter law series. They have sample questions. So when you think you really know it, test yourself. See if you really know it. And again, if you have problems, bring them to me and say, hey, 
something doesn't add up here. You said A, and it looks like the answer is C. I think, I hope, I can reconcile what I've told you in the classroom versus what you see in your book, or else I'm in bad shape. So um, do consider, you know, through Amazon or whatever your favorite outlet is, um, buying these used books. They can be used. Ben, you'll appreciate that, right? You can buy the used books uh, and buy them inexpensively, but then um, you know, use them and really test yourself. All right, question two. Car dealer uses some land, uh, cars for demonstration purposes. Are the cars depreciable? What do you think? How would you call the car that you, many of you have bought cars, Michael? I mean, here, because you're using it in their business, I would say yes. What kind of, are they 1231 assets or are they something else? Uh, if held over a year, I would say 1231 assets. They're the first one. Okay, let me ask you a different question. Have you ever gone car shopping, Michael? Yes. And have you ever driven that um, car? Okay. When you're driving the test car, uh, the person who's driving you, would they be willing to sell you the test car? Yes. Look, that and their firstborn, right? <laughs> All right. My point is, is it more an aroma of inventory or an asset used in a trader business? What's the stronger aroma, guys? Inventory. inventory. All right. Those cars are meant to be sold. Um, so. Um, that's how they're, they're, they they really are not part of the 1231 assets. They are considered inventory because uh, the deal was anxious to sell those cars, right? Question three. Merch has been in business for four years. Sells a proprietorship, okay? All of which except for the inventory has been held for more than one year. Uh, Merchant also agrees that for an additional 20000 she will not compete in the same geographical area for the next 10 years. Uh, disregarding 1245 and 1250, what are the tax consequences of the merchant sells her business for 140? Guys, give me numbers and characters. Babe, I'm going to keep my mouth for up for two minutes. Write out an answer. Don't play games. Don't, don't just come and take two minutes, pretend it's an exam. What would you write here as the numerical outcome and the character of the income? All right, let's, let's just quickly, everyone here should be able to compute under Code Section 1001 the amount of the gain for the loss, right? This is not, you know, hopefully something which people are going to find it is a real challenge. So, Angel, Frank, and Matt, can you just tell me the numerical part of this? On the, on the inventory, goodwill, land, building, machinery, gain or loss, guys? Just tell me how much I'll write it down. I'm listening. 8,000. 8, okay, keep going. 20. 20. 20. 15. 20. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15
code section 10 on one. We take the amount realized less the adjusted basis and um, it's in the building of 15. The building should be 15. The building is 15. That's right. I don't know where you got 50 because I, I'm just, I know, I just wrote down. All right, 15. Okay? Now, um, she gets also paid $20,000 not compete. Amanda, how did you treat that $20,000? And Andrew, see if you're great. The $20,000 not to compete. Andrew, agree or disagree? Andrew? Nice try. Michelle? What's okay. game? Let's be careful with the word gain, guys. Michael, you know what's ordinary income? It's ordinary income under what code section? 61A. 61. If someone pays you to work, you get compensation, it's taxable as ordinary income. If someone pays you not to work, it's ordinary <coughs> income. We're not talking about it being a gain, right, everyone? Frank, you were going to comment? No, I was just going to ask where we're going to do that. Okay, so it's just compensation income, even though it's payment on compete. Now, um, in terms of character, in terms of character, EK, how would you characterize the income here? And then Leo and Nick, see if you agree. EK? Uh, I'll just write it down, you tell me. Ordinary. I'm just going to write it down and keep going. Um, ordinary. Capital. Capital. Um, uh, capital loss, I would say. And what, what? Capital gain and the motion is ordinary Leo, agree or disagree? I disagree. What would you say? Uh, let's say it's uh, capital. Uh, Here? Yep. Capital? Yeah. Uh, capital. Um, that's a. Uh, that, that's a capital loss. No. Nick, agree or disagree? Uh, disagree. Disagree with both? Yeah. What would you say? The inventory is ordinary. Right? The will is ordinary. And it's capital. Building is uh, capital loss. Building, so, building is what? Capital gain. Right? Machinery is capital gain. Don't take this the wrong way tonight, we can do it. But we're all for three. Okay. Well, let me just ask upper tier Dave. You agree? Disagree? Well, I, I agree with him, but he said it was wrong. So. <laughs> but, daughter, are you going to say something or are you just stretching? I'm stretching. Angie? I'm not sure. Jacqueline? Uh, Any flaws here? Dan? And Jacqueline? Google's got Goodwill is capital. Let's get that straight. Everyone agree? Yes. Goodwill is capital gain. <coughs> right? When you look at um, 1221 assets, goodwill is always doesn't fall within scope of any exceptions. What about inventory? Let me erase this. Inventory is always going to give rise to ordinary income, guys. Under Williams v. McGowan, under Williams v. McGowan, we got to look asset by asset by asset, right? Inventory is always going to give rise to ordinary income. Goodwill is a capital asset, capital gain. What about the land, the building, and the machinery, guys? What kind of assets are those? Job. What kind of assets? Job. What kind of assets? Where are you going to put these, Joe? Capital. 
No, you're killing them. You're going to put them in the big pot. The main hot pot. What kind of assets are these, Joe? The shell. They're 1231 assets, right? They belong in the main hodgepodge, right? Perla, right? EK, right? These, these three assets, we got to group together. They are 1231 assets. So they're capital. 1231 is not capital, Joe. Look at the definition of 1221. You will not do well next week. You will not do well in practice if you call 1231 assets capital assets. They may give rise to a capital gain, right, Joe? But they are not capital assets. I'm not in capital gain. Be careful. Language is important here. OK? So the main hodgepodge. Everyone see the main hodgepodge? Do the gains exceed the losses, or do the losses exceed the gains? So what kind of treatment will these three have? Thank you. I'm supposed to hear a loud chorus. Dan, just for exam purposes, is that how we should show, or should we show the land as ordinary and net? No, the land is not ordinary. Why well, would the land be ordinary? Individually, it is, right? So when we did no, it, no, 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 Dan, we didn't see a land being ordinary. But that, then, we, then we write some of the stuff as, oh no, we wrote it down, okay. Because right. the losses yeah. there exceeded the gains. That's part of the main hodgepodge. That is not ordinary. I promise you, that's not ordinary. Not even close. Right? You got it? This was where the losses exceeded the gains. That's why I got ordinary loss treatment. Joe? Yeah. So here the only capital asset is goodwill. Yeah, that's it. And the only difference in problem B here says what difference if merchant's business had always been incorporated and she was the sole shareholder. And she had a $90,000 basis in her stock, which she sells for $120,000. And then she's also paid $20,000 not to compete. Amanda, how are we going to treat that $20,000 not to compete? Ordinary Under what code section? 61. Absolutely. How are we going to treat the sale of stock, Amanda? Corey, how are we going to treat the sale of stock? How much? Ankit, do you agree? Uh, yes, exactly. How much? Uh, 30,000. 30,000 capital gain. If you sell stock, you don't look at the individual asset, right? So if you sell the stock, it's 30,000 capital gain, 20,000 of ordinary income. Michelle. Those both would be left out of the, the hot spot, right? What, what, what? Those both. Uh, what, what is both? I don't know. Uh, the sale of the, the stock. The sale of the stock moved the whole issue. There's no hot spot. Okay, okay. Period. Okay. Game over. You're selling the stock. There's no, you're not selling 1231 assets, right, Michelle? Yep. Game over. Dan? In the event, let's just say the land was a $20,000 loss in this, in this instance. But here? Yes. Okay, the law of land, 20000 For exam purposes, we're showing the land as an ordinary loss, and then the other two as capital still? Or no, 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 how the land? losses exceed the gains, this is all ordinary. So we, everything goes as ordinary. Yes, okay. not everything, these we're two We're net those three, okay, understood. Okay. okay, so the end's back pattern, if the loss of the land was 20, and the losses would exceed the gains, this would be ordinary, this would be ordinary, right? Because in the main hodgepodge, right, Joe, we stir it all up, and if the losses exceed the gains, then it's all ordinary. Even this, what would we want to be careful about, Dan? In, in my original fact pattern, in the book's original fact pattern, um, where this is a 10K, what would you want to be really careful about, everyone in this room? Big room, you're thinking it. What are you thinking you've got to be really careful about before you contact the client, and what would you tell the client? Michael? Uh, to um, the, the look back. Look back, right? 
Because even though this might give rise, in this case, to $7,000 of capital gain, right, you might think, we better look back five years because 1231 losses may recharacterize this 7,000 in capital gain as ordinary income, right, John? John, your hand. Is uh, inventory not included in the hot spot? It is definitely not. 1231 only includes 1231 assets in the high spots. Do not throw that in the pot. So inventory is only ordinary. Absolutely. It's not a 1231 asset. Yeah. So you said if the land was a $20,000 loss, it would net to what a $3,000 ordinary loss? Yeah. yeah. Everything would be ordinary then, meaning in, a, in the main hodgepodge. So what else goes into the 1231 asset? Is that the Any asset used in a trader business? Held over a year. Held over a year that's depreciable. Land and depreciable assets. Goodwill is not depreciable, so it's not considered a 1231 asset. Unless it's purchased good well. But all right, guys, we have a lot to do. So I need eight minutes. I will see everyone back here. Let's take a break and we've got to finish chapter 22. <laughs> Joe no Bankman's at Stanford, very good guy, Catherine Pratt. Uh, solid citizen, uh, Katie goes, she goes by Katie. Um, I'm actually meeting her in New Orleans for a lecture oh, in November. Uh, we're, we're, we're doing, uh, I'm moderating a tax panel in November. Uh, so having said that, uh, it, it's a good book now it's getting it on friends with two of the three authors. All right. Um, all right. Any questions regarding this before we march into chapter 22? All right, chapter 22 has three important code sections we're going to give you tonight. Three more to add to your ever growing repertoire of important code sections. Code sections 1239, 1245, and 1250. All right? 1239 does not come up often in practice, and that's what makes it dangerous, right? Because if it came up all the time, then you would say, gee, I'm, I'm sensitized to it. 1239 does not. It comes up infrequently. 1239 is in the code for what reason? Why? For those who had a chance, if you opened up to code section 1239, why did Congress put it in the air? Andrew, you're going Say it loudly. Sure. And by the way, as you're thinking, again, for those who came in a bit late, let me again pitch November 9th. If you can, try to make it for those who came in late um, that we are having this tax event. Two great speakers are coming. Uh, hypnotist, dinner, um, tax. I mean, in and of itself, that should be the entree that brings you. Uh, but there will be fun and games. Um, and it, it's a unique event, I, I promise you. Winner of those, it will be unique. Okay, Andrew, did my little pitch here. Uh, so, um, goal 39 is um, in relation to gain from sale and depreciation of property between um, certain related taxpayers. Okay. So, uh, that pertains to uh, spouses and also business partners. Um, and so, why did Congress put this here? What was the gain taxpayers were seeking to play? Well, Technically, if I bought something from my spouse, I would... Well, that's not a good idea because 1041 applies now, so there's no gain or loss. Okay, so the idea here is that people would kind of use the... They would get a new basis on the property if they sold it, and they also experienced the capital gain. Okay, but that's a bad thing. Why would anyone in their right mind uh, experience a gain, have to pay tax? Sounds like a bad planning idea, gone awry, Andrew. What's the, what's the bonus here? Well, the problem here is that there's usually, uh, this prevents the connection within the business or uh, the family member. But I don't understand. Why did Congress put this here, Andrew? I'm, a, I'm your client. Explain to me why I should be concerned. Andy, you have your hand up. Say it louder. Twice? Say it louder. Like when. 
The related party gets a new basis and starts depreciating. What's the problem with that? So the person who owns the property before already put the depreciation. The person who bought the property what? Before already put the depreciation. I agree, but there's a toll charge. So you're going to have to recognize the gain. So what's 1239 going to do to put the price on that line? Prevents you from taking the capital gain and the ordinary loss. Okay, ordinary deductions. Let's, let's frame this. Okay, 1239, here's the gain. And by the way, this court decision articulates it nicely. If you look at the footnote on page 767, look at the first footnote. The net effect may be shown graphically in a hypothetical case. Everyone see this footnote on the bottom of the page? Or the transferor holds property depreciated to a value of 2000 Or sells the property for 6000 to E, his controlled corporation. So here, taxpayer is selling it to a related party. It's like selling it to your alter ego, selling it to yourself, right? Everyone agree? Yeah. And if you have a 100% wholly owned company and you sell it to yourself, essentially, you're looking in the mirror and you're selling the asset. And you're like, holy cow, who's going to do that? You're going to have to recognize a $4,000 gain, right? Sounds stupid on its face, right? But keep reading. Our pace maximum capital gains rate is 25% of the $4,000 for tax of $1,000. Okay, now the related party, E, with a basis of $6,000 on the property, takes depreciation deductions from ordinary income. And for four or five years of these deductions, E has depreciated the property back to the $2,000 basis. E has then deducted $4,000 of depreciation from ordinary income. If E is in the 50% tax bracket, the $4,000 of depreciation deductions has saved him $2,000 in income tax. Or therefore has paid $1,000 in capital gains and has um, saved $2,000 in income taxes. So if R and E are identical, and in cases they are related, that's true, then R has avoided $2,000 in taxes by only paying $1,000. So if you're willing to pay an upfront toll charge of capital gains, then you can play games and uh, command ordinary deductions. And just keep in mind that Code Section 168K, which we'll be looking at after the midterm, you can get 100% expensing now after the new tax act. So there's a chance in the year 2018, theoretically, if you were no Code Section 1239, this year you could have a capital gain of 1,000 where you pay $1,000. And the same year, ignoring there's no time value money issues, you can immediately command a $6,000 deduction immediately. So, but that's not true because of Code Section 1239. So 1239 says, no, you don't get a capital gain. We're gonna force you to have ordinary income. What's my message to everyone in this room? And it's a message to myself. Anytime you hear of a transaction with a related party, you may not remember Code Section 1239, okay? Truth, you may not because it doesn't. But you should be sensitive that any time a client's talking to you, about a transaction, and I've had this where clients, and not, they don't do it for tax planning reasons. They come to you and they want to sell for, what it, for business reasons. They want to sell an asset to a related business. And you have to be the bearer of bad news and say, no, no, it's ordinary income. All right, so be forewarned that this does come, but I'm just telling you, your antenna should go up anytime you hear that there's a transaction with a related party, guys. You may not remember the code section a day, a week, a month from now, but you better remember it for next week. But for that, and for the final exam. All right, so ignore me for a second. You should remember. But after that, I have to say, all bets are off. You may not hear about this code section for weeks or months or years to come. But if you hear about a transaction between related parties, you better think to yourself, gee, special rule might apply. And that's universal. That's not just in this context. Often there are special rules to stop collusion. All right. So what happened in Parker? In a nutshell, what what was the what were the facts in this case? Frank, do you recall? Uh, yeah, there were two. This one thing, there were two owners that had uh, one at eighty percent, twenty or ninety two. That's right. Yeah. Tax, there was, our tax pair at eighty percent. Another tax pair at twenty percent. And the 80% taxpayer, right, Frank, sold depreciable equipment to the company, right? Right. And the question before the court was what? Um, I think this was, uh, 
the question arose because he had control, so he had an access. Well, what, what was the issue? Just frame the issue before you try to resolve the issue. Uh, maybe it was clear on the issue. Mike, what's the issue? The question is really the point here. Well, the question is, does 1239 apply? And when we say does 1239 apply, was this, quote unquote, a related party? Now, Frank, what was the test? Uh, well, since it exceeds, he had 80% even though uh, in his E20, his stop is devalued and it comes in over a Can I ask you a question, Frank? When you look at your code, code section 439, what percentage do you see there? Dan, do you make sure? 50. And so it says 50. Why is, the code, why, is the, why is this case referring to 80%? Say again? Older code. Older code. The law of yesteryear, when this case was adjudicated, there was an 80% threshold. Okay? That threshold has been changed to 50%. Everybody agree? Corey, um, does the code, um, does that mean that 1239 has been liberalized, or meaning it's become have more have bigger teeth or does it have smaller teeth in the estimate of the change in the law or in other words we went from 80 percent to 50 percent does that mean it, it it has it's more of a paper tiger it's more of a tiger with meaningful teeth for it and then joe see if you agree Which is? More meaningful. More meaningful. Joe, great, and Michelle, final word. You're not sure? Michelle? <coughs> you not sure? Dave? <coughs> what? Bigger teeth. Bigger teeth, why? So it's going to be more likely to apply or less likely to apply? It's going to be much more likely to apply, right? Having more than 80% of the value, that's not so easy to make. But more than 50% may not be easy, but it's easier than 80%. So it has bigger teeth, Lori. Much bigger teeth. But at the time this case was rendered, the back pattern involved transpired in the year in which the, there was an 80% threshold. Okay? It was 80, more than 80% of the value. So Frank, we have someone, let's just assume, keep it simple here, there are 100 shares outstanding, our taxpayer at 80, the other shareholder at 20, why would this statute even apply? Because you have to have more than 80%, right Frank? Yeah. So how could this possibly apply? Uh, actually, I was kind of confused on that. Okay, but hold on, and then Mike will take you, Matt. Uh, I think it was because the department owned 80% of the stock had controlling interest in the company. So because he had control of the shares, they were valued more. Right. Everybody agree that the statute refers to 80% in the value. It doesn't say 80% interest in the company. It says more than 80% of the value. Now, suppose I own a company. Okay, picture if you will. I own a company worth a million dollars. It has a million dollars worth of assets, right? But if you add all, all this stuff, it has value of, of assets worth a million dollars. Solid owns 80% of the stock, and um, Angie owns the other 20%, okay? Everybody in the visual? Okay. Um, uh, Francis, how much are you gonna offer me for my shares in it? And then, uh, Jonas, see if you would offer the same, more or less of the same. Francis, how much do you offer me? Well, you're a tough negotiator. <laughs> <laughs> the company's worth a million dollars. No, a million? You're going to offer me a million? But I only own 80 out of the 100 shares. You're still going to offer me a million? I'm sorry? I mean, don't get me wrong, I like your offer, but uh, <laughs> you're only going to get 80% 80, 80 of the shares. How much do you want to offer me? 500,000? Oh, now, now I'm not so sure I want to. <laughs> Your, your, your offer. Jonah, is that the right number? 800. You're going to offer me 800? 
And, and in this case, Jason, are you offering anything the same or less? Should I take it, Jason? Should I take that offer? Well, does it does it make sense, Michael? It doesn't make sense because you're buying control interest, so it's worth more than. The yeah, it's chances are sold it into the department for eight hundred thousand because it's a controlling interest, and by the same token, Angie's interest. How much are you going to offer, Valerie, for Angie? How much are you offering? You should take that off. <laughs> Don't go on Shark Tank. I mean, you're only getting a 20% interest of a million dollar company. How much would you offer? 200. 200? Kim? David, how much would you offer? But guys, you shouldn't be offering 200. You should not offer 200 because you know, I'm the majority shareholder. I'm not going to be kind. You buy her interest, Angie's interest, I get to set the salary. I get to set corporate governance issues. I can wake up one morning and decide, gee, someone deserves a million dollar bonus. Poof. You have no interest in it. You, you can't tell me otherwise. You'll come to you to bring a suit as a minority shareholder. So if someone offers you a minority interest in the absence of a meaningful shareholders agreement, you know, you're going to offer pennies on the dollar. Being a minority shareholder is not much fun. So everyone see that for my controlling interest, it's probably worth about nine, 900, 950. Angie's interest, even though it's 20%, maybe worth 20,000, 50,000 at most. Everyone agree? Everyone see that? Yes. So in this case, right, Frank, Parker loses because the IRS is able to say he owned more than 80% of the value. There was real restrictions on the minority shareholder's interest. It was not worth the 20%. His 80% interest was worth far in excess of the 80%. So he owned more than 80% of the value. Everyone's got that? All right, then let's look at the problems on page 771. Depreciators, the shareholder of the depreciation report, and owns 20% of its stock. Depreciator spouse owns 10%. And their adult son owns 10%. Okay? Depreciator. Depreciator spouse and the son. And depreciator owns 20%. Depreciator spouse owns 10%. And the son owns 10%. Remaining stock is owned by unrelated parties. The current year depreciator sells to redepreciation for $110,000, a building use in depreciator's business and depreciated on a straight line with a $40,000 adjusted basis and an $80,000 value, and land and the underlying land with a uh, $10,000 adjusted basis and $30,000 of value. Okay? So we have building, we have land, we have adjusted basis. We have fair market value, we have gain. Background. Andrew. 
Okay. Can I? Go ahead, Mike. 60,000 capital. Why, Mike? Uh, they only own 40%, so 1239 doesn't apply. Okay, 1239, so. these are not considered related parties, right? Because 1239 doesn't apply in this context because when you look at the aggregate percentage, the appreciator owns 40%. Everyone agree? That being the case, 1239 doesn't apply. What kind of assets are these, Mike? Capital. Are they? You're killing me. 1231. They're not capital assets, right, Joe? Right. They're not capital assets. They're 1231 assets. They may give rise to capital gain, but they are not capital assets. Are we okay with that? Yeah. Suppose instead spouse owns twenty percent and son owns twenty percent. In this case, um, Matt, Nick, and Ben. What is the character of the uh, the building gain and the land gain? Matt, you want to start us off? Nick and Ben, see if you agree or disagree. Uh, for B, it yeah. would be a, uh, would be an ordinary game because they own more than 50 percent as a... Not they, just be careful. Depreciators deem to own more than 50 percent of the value, right? Because you look at his ownership and then you look at the ownership by attribution, right? So he's deemed to own the shares of his spouse and his son, right? Everyone agree? Depreciators deemed to own the, the shares. And ha what's my authority to get there? Because when you look at Code Section 1239, okay, related person, uh, if you look at 1239B, means a person in all entities which are controlled entities. What does control mean? Um, if you look at 1239C, it means um, a corporation more than 50% of the outstanding stock which is owned by such person. What is ownership? Look at 1239C2. It shall be determined in accordance with the rules of 267C. If you look at section 267C, a member of a family includes a spouse and a child. Look at section 267C4, I believe. Okay, 267C4. Everyone see that? 267C4. Mm -hmm. That's where I get the authority that the appreciator owns 60% here. So, back to the problem B. Nick, do you stand? What do you say this, the answer is here? I agree. Four What is it? And would you agree, Ben? So just for the building? Uh, yeah, 40, 40. I'm talking about the building and the land. Uh, land doesn't appreciate, right? Last well, I checked, it doesn't. So I wouldn't say that would fall under the section that for the... Uh... Okay, guys, 1239 only applies to depreciable property, right, Matt? It's a brick wall. It's going to hurt if you bang your head against it. All right? If you think about the purpose of 1239, there's no reason why the land should get ordinary treatment because there's no abuse, right? You can't flip land and start depreciating and getting ordinary deductions, agree? So the building gives rise to ordinary income, right? Because it's a related party. The land would remain a 1231 gain. So for your notes, building, ordinary income, land, capital gain. Uh, All right, question C. Any questions, any problems? Question C. What result is spouse owns 10 percent, spouse's brother owns 10 percent, son owns 20 percent? So we're back to the spouse owning 10 percent, right? If 
spouse's brother, DSD, only 10%. Okay, everyone got that? Okay. Does 1239 apply? Right, that's the issue. Ron, Mike, EK? What do you guys say? Does 1239 apply here? Mike, you say no? Mike, was that a no? Correct. No. Ron? Uh, I, don't, I don't think you count the spouse and brother. Okay, EK? Yeah, I agree with you. So what's your final answer here? 1239 apply or not apply here? Not apply. Leo, not apply? Uh, doesn't apply. Okay, Nick? Say it applies. You said it applies. Annie? Mm -hmm. Wow. A lot of controversy in this class. <laughs> Nick, make your argument. So the stock one's 10%, um, but the other's 20%. But well, be careful with keys. There's a lot of males walking around here. So the father owns 20%, and that's what they said the spouse is 10%. Uh, 10%. Right, and so the father owns 10 spouse, so how did you get that it applies? This, isn't it sum to 50%, so it's right at Is it 50%, Nick? More than 100%. Okay. Is it 50%? Doesn't it use more than? So you want to retract your answer, Nick, or not? Yeah. Okay. Andy, do you want to retract? You sure? Anyone going to stick to your guns here? Could, uh, Nick and then Dan see if you agree with Nick. Could an argument be made that, the, that because the brother owns 10% that the value is over 50%? I was going to say the same thing. Let's pause for one minute. Let's, let's think about this as a holistic class. Okay, everyone ready? Now, how much is the father deemed to own percentage-wise of the stock? No. Oh, 50. Oh, 50. <laughs> 50. But is he deemed to own his brother-in-law's shares? No. no. Well, could you say the brother-in-law's shares are attributed to mom, to, to the wife, and then they're attributed to him? Could you? Could you say there's double attribution? You could, but you would be wrong, right? Because, look at Code Section 267, C5. Position 267C5, constructively, stock constructively owned by a person by reason of application in paragraph 1 shall for purposes of time um, 1, 2, or 3 shall be treated as actually owned. But stock constructively owned by reason of application of 2 and 3 shall be treated by him um, for purposes, again, of applying this, um, <clears throat> shall not be treated, shall not be treated. Um, so the, what I'm saying to you is, um, for family attribution rules, you are not. There is no double attribution. And why is there no double attribution? I'll give you a few thought theories here. Theory one is: Are we all somehow related in this room? Yes. Right. If we went up the chart long enough, I guarantee we're all cousins here. Right. And if we were allowed to have double, triple, quadruple attribution, everything would be deemed to be owned by everyone. Everyone agree? So what Code Section 267C5 says is there's no multiple attribution. Okay? So, and some of you are married. Do you get along with your brother-in-law and sister-in-law? Maybe. Maybe not. Okay? So the point is, Brother-in-law shares do not get reattributed. Okay, let me go through two different scenarios. Suppose brother-in-law owns ten percent, and brother-in-law's DB DSB spouse owns the other forty percent. Okay, everyone get the visual. So the Hatfields and the McCoys each own fifty percent, right? Yeah. Is that what I'm saying? Yeah. Do the Hatfields own more than 50% of the value here? Nick? No. Because 
there's two separate family units. Everyone agree? Suppose it's the brother-in-law owns 10%, but then it's owned by a million other people out here, okay? A million other people own the other 40%. Do the Hatfields own more than 40%, more than 50% of the value, Jacqueline? Brian, you're shaking your head no. But if you own 50% and a million people own the other 50%, don't you own more than 50% of the value? Don't you get to call all the corporate governance issues? Can't you dictate what your salaries are going to be? Yes. Everyone agree? Yes, the brother-in-law owns 10%, but if a million other people own you know, 0.001%, this family as a unit will we'll really call the shots. Everyone agree? Yes. And they own more than 50% of the value because I personally, if the company were worth a million dollars, I'd take them more than 500,000, wouldn't you? They get to control everything. So for your answer, it's not because I want to make it ambiguous, but the answer here is it could go either way. Right? So your answer, no, it's not just because you're tired and it's a Monday night that you're going to look back and equivocate here and say, why? Why does this answer say it could go either way? It could go either way. We need to know more facts. Dave? What if it was switched? It was I don't the, know what you mean. If it was the brother <coughs> and the, well, well, uh, I, If it was not the spouse and brother, but the, uh, the father's brother. Uh, yeah. Oh, I mean, if it was his brother, yeah. then he would own more than 50% because then his, his shares, uh, brothers, are, are, are by attribution. Okay, other questions? Right? If the spouse contributed the property, I, in this, so in this example... I mean, contributor sold the property. Sold the property. Then if she sold the property, she would be deemed to own more than 50 percent. Okay, based on the brother-in-law. Yeah. All right? So your answer for C could go either way. Question D, what result in B above the sales made by other corporation in which the depreciator owns 100 percent to redepreciation? So we have one company selling to another company, which one company is 100 percent owned, selling to a company which is 60 percent owned, are those related parties, guys? Are those related taxpayers? And the answer is yes. Look at 1239B1, because it includes a person and all entities which are controlled. And here, the Mr. Depreciator owns 100% of one company and 60% of another. So 1239 would apply here. So your answer is, this would give rise in the building to ordinary income, the land, right then, would remain capital gain. So your answer to D, again, ordinary income on the building, capital gain on the land. Question E, what resulted in the sales between depreciator and a trust in which the depreciator spouse is the income beneficiary? The trust will rent the property to a third party, meaning it's a 1231 asset, and it's going to be depreciated. Well, you guys can read for yourself. 1239B2 treats that as a related party. <coughs> Question E. What result did the sales between depreciator and the trust in which depreciator... Oops, we just did. Question E. Question F. What result in E. The property was a vacation residence of depreciator, the depreciator spouse, and they live in a rental apartment after the sale. So, in other words, is a vacation house uh, depreciable? If you own a vacation house, can you depreciate it? Yes. No. No, no, no. <coughs> How can you depreciate a rental, a vacation house? Personal use. Oh, it's giving your own personal use. It's your own Absolutely. Vacation. It's a va no, your vacation no, house. No, I you're renting it. No, you can't, you're right? But if you look at code, so now it's not depreciated. It's not depreciable in the hands of the transferor, right? Because it's a vacation house. But now they're selling it, right, to a related party, and it's going to be depreciated, right? Because it's, it's held out for rent. If you look at code section 1239A, 
It puts it to 1239, it talks about in the case of a sale or exchange of property, directly or indirectly between related persons, any gain recognized uh, to the transferor shall be treated as ordinary income if such property is in the hands of the transferee. Notice, in the hands of the transferee of a character which is subject to an allowance for depreciation. So here, because it is depreciable in the hands of the transferee, 1239 would apply. It's depreciable in the hands of the transferee, right? Yes. Question G. Your answer su suggests the um, purpose and scope of 1239, and all I can say is I hope so. 1245 comes up all the time, okay? So 1245, you've got to be aware it comes up all the time. And throughout the code, I will periodically mention that there are so called, in my mind, because I'm a big peanut butter and jelly fan, there are peanut butter and jelly sections. <coughs> meaning to me, they're naturals. They go together. And 1245 is a natural what code section? Recapture. It's a recapture. Well, what code sections go together? Go ahead. 1231 and 1245. Okay, 1231 and 1245 and 1250. Anytime you say 1231 property, you should also simultaneously, always, in your code, write down 1245 and 1250, okay? Anytime you think about code section 1231, you should also think about 1245 and 1250. They all go together. Anytime you think of one, you should think of the other, and if you don't, you do so with tremendous risk. Okay? And 1245 essentially says, look, if, I'm going to erase this. You buy a tractor, okay? You buy a tractor. You buy a tractor for $100, and you take $40 worth of depreciation. Your adjusted basis is 60. Everybody agree? Agree. Agree. And suppose you take that $60 tractor, and you sell that $60 tractor for three different prices. You sell it for 50, you sell it for 80, and you sell it for 120, okay? Everyone had a visual? So it's one tractor you're selling it for three different prices, right? If you sell it for 50, uh, Angie, gain or loss? All right, you got to follow it. You sold it, your adjusted basis is 60, you sell it for 50. Um, loss of 10. Loss of 10. Jacqueline, you sell it for 80, gain or loss? Gain of 20. Huh? Gain of 20. You sell it for 120. Brian, gain or loss? Gain of 60. You guys are experts, 10 to 1. You can all compute the gain and loss. Everybody agree? This 10, how would you treat it? This 10, what is the character, Leo? And next, see if you're great. Um, that would be... Only asset sold this year. Only the asset sold this year. That was the one asset sold this year. That would be the capital of the capital of the First of all, this should be a, a, a loss, right? Oh, oh, oh that's a loss. Oh, that would be ordinary income. Ordinary loss? Or ordinary loss. They can agree with this. Why not? Because it's uh, ordinary loss. That's all. It's going to sell, so it's good no gains. So the losses exceed the gains, okay? Everyone with me. We sell it for 80, and we have a $20,000 gain, okay? What is the character of that gain? EK? Half Yeah, you would think so, but EK, no longer. Because 1245 says, hey, you took sixty, you took $40 worth of ordinary deductions, right? And in retrospect, the property did not decline in value, right? Didn't decline to 60, right? 
So we actually gave you $40 worth of depreciation, but it only really declined economically by 20. Agreed? Yes. So code section 1245, so this would be an ordinary loss. 1245 says you must recapture any prior depreciation as ordinary income. So this would be ordinary income. And this does not, Miles, you'll appreciate this, this does not go on the scale. 1245 recapture does not go on the scale. It does not go part of the weighing process. Let me make another observation. There is no such thing as a 1245 loss. Everybody got that? If you ever say that, I want you to forget who, who taught you income tax. Okay? There is no such thing as a 1245 loss. You got me? It's antithetical to what 1245 is all about. Andrew, what's the problem? I, I'm curious. I really, I'm pretty sure I saw somewhere in the book. This makes sense. I understand it. But is it the way you, like, you sell it for eight? Right? Well, can I just make one more? You sell it for one twenty. You sell it for one twenty. David, what's the character? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, you sell it? Come on, got a call. You sell it for one twenty. You have recognized sixty dollars worth of gain. What's the character of the sixty? Uh, capital. Anchor. You agree? Uh, no. Forty ordinary twenty capital. Forty ordinary twenty cap. What would it be, NK? Twenty would be twelve thirty one gain. Let's be patient. Okay. So forty is twelve forty five recapture, and twenty, okay, is twelve thirty one gain. Okay? <coughs> now, uh, I, I, I'm too excited up here. Someone had a question and I just wanted to get that off my chest. So, who had the question? Andrew. No, that actually wasn't my question. <coughs> All right. Everyone got this. The notion of recapture makes sense because if Congress gave you $40 worth of ordinary deduction and you're able to sell for $120 in the rear view mirror, should you have gotten the $40 worth of ordinary deductions, guys? No. no. Nick? Is that cap at the amount of depreciation you take? Yes. The ordinary income. Now, just to be fancy, suppose we sold Let me just change the fact pattern. We sold, we sold it instead of for 50. Suppose we sold it for 20. And that means our loss here is 40, right? Everyone got it? Yeah. Change the fact pattern a little bit. And not only did we have one tractor, we had three tractors, okay? We sold, we bought three tractors originally, each for 100, and we took $40 with the depreciation. We bought these tractors a few years ago. The adjusted basis is 60 in three tractors. Everybody had the visual? Three tractors. And we sell all three this year, okay? We sell all three tractors this year. Okay? Everyone ready to tell me the character of the loss, the income, uh, the, the loss, the gain, the gain, okay? Kathy, you ready? And Zara, tell me if you agree with Kathy. So, Kathy, go ahead. Character, I'm just going to write it down. I'm listening. I'll just write it down. Keep going. Do you do that? 
this. Why, Miles? Why? Yeah. Well, what would you announce? What? We just did the last one. So if we look at the bottom, since we lost it before, it's an ordinary block. Yeah. I think that's the answer. I don't know. I think that's the answer. Now, Miles, can I, I, I don't want to certainly matter you, but if you stood up for a second and you did the weighing process, which hand would go up? The lost hand or the gain hand, Miles? I thought you do the weighing process. What? I thought you said we didn't do the weighing process. I said you didn't do it with 1245, but you still got 12, three 1231 assets. You didn't listen. I said 1245 is off the table, right? The gain associated with, but otherwise 1231 is in place, right? All right. So, Patrick, Dane, Adam, what would you guys say here? So, gains would be more than the losses in that scenario, so that it would be capital gain. So, who's saying that? Dane, say again? So the gains would exceed the losses. Why would the gains exceed the losses? Don't we have 40 of the loss? We have 60 and 20 for gains. How much of the gains? Miles would tell you this is off the table, this is off the table, right? Those are 1245 gains. Those do not go in the weighing process. Okay. So do the gains exceed the losses or the losses exceed the gains? Dane? The losses. We have 20 of losses and 20 of gain. That's the only thing, Joe, in the main hodgepodge, right? The only thing in the main hodgepodge is this and, and this, the 40, right? Do the losses exceed the gains or do the gains exceed the losses? The losses exceed the gains. Everyone agree? So this would be ordinary income, ordinary loss. Dan, you got that? Miles, you got that? 1245 is not part of the main pot anymore, right? It never was. But now, without it, we have to put two things in the pot, the 20 and the negative 40. And we see the losses exceed the gains. Hence, everything's ordinary. Nick? Why are the 20 and the 40 excluded if, if it's capped at the amount of depreciation? 1245 never goes into the pot. Period. But I thought you said you could only apply it to the 40 that was depreciated on the asset. So how would you exclude 60 of them? What, what do you mean? I'm not exclu excluding 60. I'm excluding this 40. I'm excluding this 20. <coughs> I'm excluding the 1245 here. Nick? Why would you exclude 40 from the last one? Yeah. What is the last one? I don't so, know. So um, the sale price of 120. What? Why wouldn't you exclude 40 from it, not the 20? So I feel like you, at the end you should have a loss of 10 and a gain of 20. I, I, I mean, I'm going to be lost with your number. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm just telling you, at 1245, you've got to take off the table the gains and then do your weighing process, period. And the reason the last time you did this, where there was a much smaller loss, everyone agree? There was a much smaller loss. When I sold this for 50 in the last problem, we sold it for 50, not, not 20. What was the loss here? Negative 10. Everyone agree? Yep. And then, right here, the gains exceed the losses, and that's why we had a capital, right? And I hope in your notes, this showed it as capital loss, this showed it as. Um, and I apologize, in, in C, in the prior problem, did I have it as capital or ordinary? It was separate though, we, we did them Oh, I, I know, I, we did it separately, I apologize. It was only one asset, I yes. considered it as if there was only one asset, and that's why I said it. But if we sold all three tractors, and this was the situation, right, then it would be a capital gain. This, this would be capital gain, this would be capital loss, why? Because the gains exceeded the losses. In the first problem I did, I considered it as if there was only one tractor being sold, and that's why I said it was ordinary. This is just a 1231 asset. 
1245 is just to get us back to where we took excess depreciation deduction. All right? So before we apply 1231, we have to apply 1245. Well, you have to figure out the gain and then figure out the recapture and pull the recapture income out of the equation. And it's always gain. 1245 can only be gain, it can never be a 1245 loss. Okay? There's no such thing as a 1245 loss. Now, look at code section 1245. It's out. says except as otherwise provided in this section if 1245 property is disposed of the amount which is the lower of the recomputed basis or in the case of the sale or exchange or involuntary conversion the amount realized <coughs> exceeds the adjusted basis such property such um, shall be treated as ordinary income such gain shall not be recognized notwithstanding any other provision of this subtitle but if you look at 1245d once again, it repeats itself. This section shall apply notwithstanding any other provision of this subtitle. So it's pretty serious stuff, right? 1245 is saying you got to recognize the gain. What is your recomputed basis, guys? It says take the lesser of the amount realized or your recomputed basis. Look at 1245A2. The term recomputed basis means with respect to any property is a adjusted basis recomputed by adding thereto all adjustments reflected in such adjusted basis on account of deductions. So essentially, I'm going to oversimplify it, but it's true 99.9% .9 of the time. Your recomputed basis is your original cost basis, right? It's whatever your adjusted basis is plus your prior depreciation deductions. So your recomputed basis is often 100, in this case 100, right? And if you sell it for 80, what's the lesser of your recomputed basis? or the amount realized? Well, the lesser amount is the amount realized, right? It's 80. What's the lesser of 100 or 80? Well, you guys can figure it out. It's 80, right? Over the adjusted basis, 80 less 60 is the adjusted basis. Hence, 20 is treated as ordinary income. All right. So, questions on 1245. The most important thing is you've got to remember to take 1245 out of your 1231 cap computations. Let's look at the problem on page 777. <coughs> Recap: A calendar year taxpayer owns equipment. The recap uses in business. Well, what kind of asset is it? It's recap uses it in its business. 1231, right? Is it a capital asset, Joe? Joe, is it a capital asset? <coughs> Francis, is it a capital asset? Um, I'm sorry? Is it a capital asset, Michael? David? No. No. It's a 1231 asset, right? It ain't no capital asset. Your equipment was purchased in year one for $100,000 in this five-year property. We're going to talk a lot more about depreciation. Do not worry about depreciation. Um, you're not going to have to compute it for the midterm. In the final, you will. Recap deducted 100% of the cost under 168K. So that means the adjusted basis went from 100 down to zero. Assume recap has no net 1231 losses in prior years. But why is the author telling us no 1231 losses in prior years? Why? Ben? Look back. Look back, 1231C, right? Authors are saying, don't worry about 1231C. What happens if recap 
Until his equipment expired in year 7 for 30. What's the amount realized, guys? 30,000. What's the character? Ordinary income. Why? 1245 recapture income. Why? What's the recomputed basis here? 40? What is it? The recomputed basis? Is that right? Uh, EK? Mike? It's 100. Isn't the adjusted basis here 0 plus the prior depreciation deductions of 100? The recomputed basis here is 100. What's the lesser of the recomputed basis or the amount realized? The amount realized is 30 over the adjusted basis of 0. That gives rise to 30,000 of ordinary income. What's my authority? Code section 1245. Question B. You don't have to worry about this again. I wouldn't ask this, but code section 179 plus um, accelerate a bonus depreciation. So the answer to question B is the same, but that's immaterial for our purpose. Question C, what result to recap in A above if A had failed, if recap had failed to take any depreciation deductions on the equipment? So what happens if you fail to take any depreciation deductions? Look at 1245 um, A to B. A to B. For purposes of subparagraph A, if the taxpayer can establish by adequate records or other sufficient evidence that the amount allowed for depreciation or amortization for any period was less than the amount allowable, the amount added for such period shall be the amount allowed. So if the taxpayer took no depreciation deductions, right? Are, are you, um, how do I say this? Are you allowed to choose whether or not to take depreciation deductions? No, you are not. In other words, why? Because the code forces you to, because otherwise, what would taxpayers do? They would take depreciation deductions when they wanted to offset income, right? They would play games. So the code, Code Section 168, mandates that you take depreciation deductions. You don't have a choice. And if you don't take them, your adjusted basis in your property still goes down. Because if that weren't true, again, taxpayers would play games, right? So you don't have a choice. Either you take depreciation deductions or your basis goes down. So what is the taxpayer's basis in problem C? It's still a zero, but they didn't take depreciation deductions. So therefore, what is their recomputed basis? What is their recomputed basis here? It would be zero, right? Because they didn't take any depreciation deductions. So what's the lesser of 30 or zero? Zero, right? So in that case, is there any recapture income? And the answer is no. And that makes sense, right? Because the, the taxpayer didn't get the <coughs> advantage, right, of ordinary deductions. Agree? Yeah. They did not get the advantage of ordinary deductions. So for your answer here, it would be 30,000 at 1231 gain. And we, we would see if the gains exceeded the losses or the losses exceeded the gains. And that answer should be logical to you because, again, taxpayer did not get any ordinary deductions. Question D, what result if recap sells the equipment to spouse? Now remember, 1245 says all gains shall be recognized, notwithstanding any other provision in this subtitle. So will this trigger a gain, Ron? What do you think? Kim, what do you think? Trigger gain? Um, not top. On this one, on D, no, no. Why not? What's your authority? I, I, I don't know, I said 1239. I don't know, I found 1239 has no relevance here. Valerie? Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Angie? Any authority? You can't just cite to 10, 1041, right? Because 1041, remember, section 1245 
D says this provision knocks out everything in the code, right? Notwithstanding any other provision in this subtitle. So we have to recognize the recapturing come here? Yes. No. Check out 1245B, which is entitled what? 1245B is entitled exceptions. And 1245B1 says gifts. And 1241, excuse me, code section 1041 says treats transfers between spouses as gifts. So therefore, 1245B1 for the authority that no gain would be recognized here. Everybody got that big room? You got that in your notes? Don't get, don't get tired of it. So 10, 1041 doesn't work? 1041 works, but you need, to, you need a bridge to get there. And 1245B1 gets you there. You said 1245B1 is the exceptions? Yeah, look at 1245B. It's entitled exceptions to when 1245 would apply. Question E. What result above if as a result of the scarcity of equipment, Recap is able to sell equipment to desperate for 110? So suppose you bought equipment for 100,000, depreciated down to zero. Now you're able to sell it for 110. What is the character of the 110, guys? Go ahead, Dan. Um, 100,000 ordinary and $10,000 capital gain. See, 100,000, 1245, 10,000, 12, gain, and we're gonna be patient, right, Dan? Everybody agree? We have 100,000, 1245 recapture, and 10,000, right, 1231 gain. And this is 100,000, 1245 ordinary income. Right? Make sense? In question F, what result in E above if, in addition, Recap sold some land used for storage in the business for $9,000? Recap had owned the land for three years and it, and it, um, and it had a $20,000 adjusted basis. Any gain or loss here on the sale of the land? Loss, loss of how much? Say again? $11,000 loss, right? What's the character of the loss? <coughs> What's the character of the loss? Vikram? Um, it's an ordinary loss. Why? Um, Jody, you agree? I expect everyone in the crowd to be using their hands. <coughs> Miles, are you using your hands? Yeah. And what do you come up with, Miles? Which hand is being raised higher? Your lost hand or your gain hand? Jason, what hand? Um, gains outweigh the loss. Really? Why? Yeah. Anything else, Jason? Or is that the only thing in the Oh, uh, wait. <laughs> no, uh, loss is outweighed. So you're taking, you're retracting your own answer, Jason? Yes. You're firing yourself? Yes. And you're rehiring yourself? Yes. His losses exceed his gains. Why, Jason? Yeah, the 1245 is off the table. Everybody agree? 1245 gain is not part of the main hotspot. But then he looks at the 10,000 and the 11,000, 1231 gain and loss, and he says, the losses exceed the gains. And if the losses exceed the gains, this is an ordinary loss, this is ordinary income. Game over. Done? Right, Jason? Feels good? Feels right? Can you be right? Matt, Frank, Angel, you got that? 
Next question. Suppose the same, except the price of the land was, um, sales price was 15, okay? Gain or loss here, Kim, the land was sold for 15. The land was sold for 15. Gain or loss on the land? Not a trick question. Uh, David? David? Loss. Loss of how much? The loss there would be a $5,000 loss. David, what's the character? Ordinary. Ordinary? Would you agree, Dan? Capital. I've got 1231. Ryan? Who's right? It's 1231. You didn't answer. Uh, Capital or ordinary loss? That's a Why? Uh, because if you're going to get some added with the 10,000 gain from the... Uh, hey, David, the gains exceed the losses. You're killing me. You're killing me. The gains exceed the losses, so this is a capital gain, capital loss. Right? Everyone agree? The answer to G, capital gain, capital loss. And of course, the 1245 is always the ordinary income. All right? Andrew? Ordinary income because the 100000 is the, um, the depreciated amount, correct? Yeah. Okay. All right, give me, guys, give me five more minutes with code section 1250. All right? 1250 used to be harder. Now 1250 is easy. Why? Code section 1250, okay? Code section 1250 says that if you sell a building and you take depreciation on it, you take, buy a building for 100,000 and you take 40,000 of depreciation, your just basis is 60 in the building and we're gonna have the visual, okay? If you sell the building for a loss, what kind of asset is the building? What kind of asset, Joe? I'm going to kill you on this one if you don't get it right. Joe, what kind of asset is the building, Joe? Thank you. Is it a capital asset, Joe? Thank you. All right. Um, it is not a capital asset. It is a 1231 asset. It's depreciable, right, Joe? And if you sold it for 40, uh, what is the character, Joe? This, this is the only building you sold for the year. Mike? Why? You sold it for 40 days. The losses exceed the gains, Joe. It's only one asset, right? <coughs> you sold it for 40. We'd have a $20 loss, right? Everyone got that? We'd have a $20 loss, right? If we sold it for 70, we'd have a 10 Ten dollar gain, okay? Now, with twelve fifty, unlike twelve forty five, twelve fifty applies to real property. It applies to buildings for our purposes. Twelve forty five does not. Code section twelve fifty says that is. Notice what I'm going to say. It is unrecaptured. Un, not recaptured. It's called unrecaptured twelve fifty gain. Unrecaptured 1250 gain, Miles, you'll appreciate this, does go into the weighing process, okay? Unlike 1245, because it is not considered recapturing income, it's considered unrecaptured, okay? Unrecaptured. And that $10,000 of unrecaptured gain goes into the weighing process, and it is taxed as a special rate. Under code section 1H, it is subject to a 25% rate, okay? 25%, not the normal capital gains rate. Truth be told, were Jay Soli king for the day or president for the day? Personally, I wouldn't force people to recap, I would get rid of code section 1250 
and make everything taxable under 1245. In my mind, I don't know, what, I know why. The, the, the real estate industry is very powerful, um, but from a, you've got the ordinary deduction here, you should have to recapture this as ordinary income. Ignore me, that's not the law. The law is, this gets this preferential rate, 25%. If we sell it, guys, for 150, what do we have here? 60 unrecaptured gain, excuse me, I apologize. We have 40 unrecaptured gain, 40 unrecaptured gain, and what about, we sold it, uh, and there, there's $90 worth of gain, the other 50 is 1231 gain, right? And we'll see if the gains exceed the losses or the losses exceed the gains. Right? Let's do this one problem, and if we go five minutes over, I promise you, you have five minutes in the bank. For two weeks from now, we will be dismissed five minutes early. How's that? So, bank, you can bank this, okay? Look at problem um, A. Well, problem one just says, 1250 used to have a much broader application because re buildings used to be able to be depreciated prior to 1986 on an accelerated method. And to the extent of the accelerated method, there used to be an ordinary income portion. No longer. Buildings placed in service after 1986, you can only use straight line depreciation. And as a result, because there's only straight line depreciation, there's only two characters that you can get to um, buildings. Unrecaptured gain and 1231 gain. That's the only two that apply. Unrecaptured, just like what we did. So if you look at the problem, problem two, uh, January 1st of 20, 2003, or, um, owner purchased commercial real estate at a cost of uh, 880, of which 780 was eligible to the building and 100,000 eligible to the land. Owners of single taxpayers, $2,000 for the um, salary income in 2019. Owner sells the building at the end of next year for a million dollars, with 890 of the purchase price being eligible to the building and 110 allocable to the land. He says, disregard the mid-month convention and assume depreciation purposes that the building was held for, a full, uh, for the full years in 2003 and 2019 and assume no other 1231 gains and losses. Now, I'm just telling you, you wouldn't know this, but buildings, put down in your notes, are normally commercial buildings depreciable over 39 years. Okay? If you do the arithmetic, you bought a building for $780,000 and it's depreciable over 39 years, okay? Do the arithmetic. What this means is that you would get $20,000 of depreciation a year, right? 39 into 780 is 20. And if you took depreciation from 2003 to 2019, that's 17 years of depreciation. What's 17 times 20? That's $340,000 of depreciation. So your adjusted basis here is $440,000 adjusted basis. Okay? So we have a building and we have land. We have a building and then we have a land. And we're told the purchase price is all equal uh, $890 to the building. One tenth for the land, right? Total purchase price is a million. And we know the adjusted basis of the building is 440. And we know the adjusted basis of the land is 100,000. The original, right? It's not depreciable. Any gain or loss here? Well, there's a gain of 450. Any gain or loss on the land? Yes, 10,000, right? Given that, What is the gain on the land? What, what is the character of the gain? Is it recapture or unrecaptured or something else? What kind of asset is the land? 1231. 1231. Everybody great? 1231. What 
What about the 450? Hint, hint, we're going to have two arrows. Suggest what are we going to do with the gain on the land? How much? 110. 110 is 1231 gain. And what about the 340 balance? 1250. Let's call it unrecaptured 1250 gain. Unrecaptured 1250 gain. So this 10,000 is. Right, the gains exceed the losses, right? Mm -hmm. So this is taxed at 20%, it's capital gain, taxed at 20%, the 340 is taxed at 25%. Everyone see that? This is traditional, the 340 is unrecaptured gain. What results of owner on the sale of A above if owner also had a $20,000 long-term capital loss on the sale of stock? Okay. So the total here, by the way, is 120, right? 120,000 at 20% and 340 at 25%, right? And now if we have a $20,000 capital loss, where would you net it against? Would you net it against the unrecaptured, or would you net it against the um, 1231 capital gain? And remember, you've got to net against similar categories. You would end up netting against this, okay? So that $20,000 loss, would make this $100,000 taxable at 20%. You can't net it against the, the um, unrecaptured gain. So just so you know, I, I appreciate that no one got up and discussed. I owe you guys 10 minutes. I'll give you two minutes for every minute you stayed after. So we have the exam next week, but remind me, in two weeks, we'll let you go at 8.50, okay? I will be around all this week. Anyone have any questions?